Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and um, start this session. Um, I just inhaled a sandwich, so <laughs> give me one second. <laughs> so everyone go ahead, grab your lunch, um, have a seat. And what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to talk about maximizing diagnostic yield with AI-driven intraoperative imaging. I'm going to give a short intro. Um, just to bronchoscopy and navigation bronchoscopy. And then we're going to get into our two esteemed speakers that we have. We have Dr. Kyle Hogarth here from the University of Chicago. I'm not sure if he needs an introduction. Yes, well, kind of. um, as you all know, he's an interventional pulmonologist, and he um, is everything about getting out to lung nodules and being able to get a diagnosis when he's out there. And then we have jo um, Dr. Uh, Joseph Whitlark, and he is from Croger um, Health Hospital. And he is actually a thoracic surgeon. And he's going to give you a view from a thoracic surgery um, standpoint of how he uses this imaging to help him to be able to get to lung nodules. We're going to have a Q&A um, question um, and answer session at the end. We have um, someone here who will come around with a microphone. If you have any questions, just raise your hands. So with that, we'll just go ahead and get started. OK, so I'm going to start with a, a quick intro on the existing challenges we have at, um, with navigational bronchoscopy. I, myself, am an interventional pulmonologist, and I'm at the Cleveland Clinic. So starting with the history of navigational bronchoscopy, for all of those that are out there that have been doing this for a while who are kind of old at this point in time, we all remember that around 2004 is when our lives changed, right? That is when the first super dimension system came in. It was electromagnetic navigation. This was the first platform that gave us an ability to be able to get out and get lung nodules. It was the hottest thing that was out there at that time. And that was then um, very closely followed by the Varen system that then came out. And then most centers at that point either had one system or the other system. And that's what we were utilizing to be able to get to our lung nodules. How did we do with these different platforms? This was a great paper that was put out by Dr. Meta. It was kind of a meta-analysis. And what they did was they took every paper that was out there that was ever published, basically, on either one of those systems. And they looked at what was the diagnostic yield across all these um, platforms and across all these papers. And we saw that the diagnostic yield that we found was always kind of in the 70th percentile, depending on whichever paper it was. After that, there were a lot of other things that came. There was about a 10-year hiatus where, where we, were, we were all doing this. And then new things um, started coming out. At that point in the uh, 2017, the Bronchus system came out. And then the robots started coming out. First the Monarch, then the Intuitive. Um, new updated fancy fluoroscopy machines with better imaging started coming out. So that's when the SIO spin uh, came out. And then Super D went ahead and upgraded their system um, to the Illumisite. And then later on, um, Body Vision um, became, uh, came onto the market. So despite these technologies, though, when you look at more recent papers that go and look at the diagnostic yield, our yield hasn't dramatically improved. If you look at all some of these newer papers that are out that include the robot, you can see here that our numbers all kind of stay in the 70s, despite all these new technologies that came out. So why is this? Why are we still not able to do better with all these technologies? So there's a number of reasons um, that we've started to realize as time has gone on. One of them is that there's an inability to actually see the lesion intraoperatively, unless the lesion is actually sitting in the airway, right? Then that's the case that you know that you're going to have a great shot. You go out there, you see it sitting there, you can biopsy it. Most of our nodules, unfortunately, aren't sitting right in the middle of the airway, so we're not in that situation. We've recently become very aware of CT to body divergence, and I'm going to go into that um, a little bit. And then we, when we get there, we don't actually see our tool in the lesion. So we think we're there. You get your radial probe out. You kind of know you're there. But is your tool actually going where it needs to go? And we don't get that confirmation in real time. So this is CT to body divergence. This was a fantastic paper that came out um, by Mike Pritchett. And uh, what he saw is that you get a preoperative CT scan. And you see the nodule on the CAT scan. However, when you go to actually do the procedure on the day of the procedure, where you think that nodule is on the CAT scan is not where that nodule actually is. 
And he was able to show this using cone beam. So you can see there on preoperative CT scan, that's where the nodule is. In real time on cone beam, that's where the actual nodule is. And there's a divergence between where you think the nodule is and where the nodule actually is. When he looked at this a little bit closer, he found that obviously there was more divergence in the lower lobes compared to the upper lobes. And this was as much as 18 millimeters in the lower lobes versus 12 millimeters in the upper lobes. Um, so what about these other EM-based systems? They all depend on these virtual targets, right? So we all get these, these t balls or targets and you can shape it however you want. It could be round, it could be exactly how the lesion looks. However, we're still getting that CT to body divergence and when we get out to that nodule and we think we're at the nodule, we're not actually seeing our tool in the lesion to confirm that that's where the tool is actually going. There's been some other newer things that have come out, such as shape sensing system. That really hasn't shown an, um, anything any better. In fact, with the shape sensing si uh, systems, they're also seeing CT to body divergence, and this has been shown and proven as well um, when they looked at this closer. So why is it that our colleagues, the interventional radiologists, do so well? Why is it that they can get yields in the upper 90s, however we can't? That's because they can overcome a lot of the limitations that we're having. They don't have the CT to body divergence, right, when they're getting to their lesions. They have a patient who's laying there, they have imaging right there, and they actually see their tool right there go into the lesion. That is why their diagnostic yields are much higher than ours. So in summary, despite the influx of all these new technologies we've had, our, our diagnostic yield still remains to be less than 80%. We have challenges of CT to body divergence. We don't actually have confirmation of tool and lesion at the time of biopsy. And so if we had something that was real time intraoperative uh, imaging during the pr procedure itself, this is something that I think would help us dramatically in being able to get a better yield. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Hogarth. Thanks, Sonali. I'm going to echo also what she just said, which is the vexing problem we always have, which is when you prove there's granulomas, but you don't see a bug, do you actually know you were in the lesion or are you getting the kind of granulomatous reaction around the tumor? That's what you get asked at tumor board every time. Are you sure you actually got it? Um, and so the idea of having real-time image guidance and proving that your tool was in the lesion is unbelievably important. And yes, we all know that we suffer from a lack of probably really good instruments in the periphery at the moment, that you can be in the middle of the lesion, that does not mean the lesion's in the middle of your tool, but the first battle's just getting there. So real-time image guided biopsies do have high yields. As Sonali just pointed out, our colleagues in interventional radiology can see that they're in the middle of it. And if you're fortunate enough to have a cone beam system at an extremely nice price, um, you can get some really fancy images that can prove that you're right in the middle of it. But as we've already probably seen, your access to this device, even if your hospital has one, is challenging. I can get one every other Thursday as long as I donate half of a kidney and the sun and the moon are perfectly, I mean, it's ridiculous, the access to it. Um, I know here in Nashville, Otis Rickman's told me they can get it every other Saturday. The day you see me scoping electively on a Saturday is, is anyway. So visual confirmation of that tool in the lesion is definitively key, right? Because if you don't know, how can you say that your biopsy was truly diagnostic if you find, say, granulomas, as an example? Clearly, whenever we find tumor on rows, or if you have rows, then there's no debate here, right? That part's the easy part. We can get there even by getting lucky. But what's also great about having real-time confirmations, and the radiologists do this, you can make adjustments. If you see by where you threw the needle, you're a little bit off to the side, okay, I'll make an adjustment of whatever platform got you there. Right? So if you're just doing it with a thin scope, great. Doing it with some catheter-based or a robot, whatever. It'd be great if you had real-time imaging so that you could adjust as needed. And the problem is the current robotic platforms that are for sale don't have that, and nor do any of the other ones. So again, you can go the cone beam route, you get some really amazing images. Um, but it's obviously very cost prohibitive. It's actually obviously even when your hospital has it, um, you know, we all know pulmonary and bronch, we don't make your hospital money directly. We make you to patients that make your hospital money. But cone beam systems get used for TAVRs. 
That makes them a lot of money. They get put in for aortic, you know, or stents and whatnot. That makes a ton of money. You're going to get bumped from a cone beam every day of the week because you don't make them money, but electrophysiology does. And so there's the barrier as well. So no one's going to buy you one. I mean, again, you might get lucky. Even Mike will tell you, Mike Pritchett, who's done the most cone beams, he didn't get one. He found an empty room that wasn't being used and took it over, right? That's how he got lucky. And the workflow is not ideal. And people talk about the radiation exposure. You ever seen a cone beam case? Everyone sprints out of the room while the patient's having a 20 second breath hold because the radiation levels are definitely high enough that no one feels comfortable just wearing their lead. I do floor all the time. So do you. I have lead on. I'm not worried about it. Cone beam time, everyone sprints to get out. So welcome to body vision. So I've been fortunate enough to have been working with this tool for quite some time, even before it was commercial. Um, now it's obviously uh, been commercialized. And what you get, and you're seeing here across the screen, screen here, interoperative 3D tomographic scans of a tool and lesion across multiple planes there on TOMO. You can see, you get the three-dimensional reconstruction of proof of it. And then while you're doing live fluoro, you get a virtual overlay on your fluoroscopy of the lesion. And what part that's cool about this, as Sonali was already talking about the CT to body divergence, your preoperative plan said the nodule was here. But we know that on the real day of the case, it's over here, right? It's moved. And if the lesion's four centimeters, who cares? But if the lesion's one centimeter, that one centimeter divergence is a big deal. That yellow ball was placed five seconds before we started taking the biopsies, because after we've done the spin and marked where it is, when that comes up, that's where it is. You've marked it from your tomosynthesis. That's as real time as it gets. So you know, and by the way, it's obviously the video is only showing you in one plane, but you uh, swing it to the left, swing it to the right, LAO, REO, you can see it constantly that you're in, which is obviously one of the big failings when we all do just standard fluoro. For all you know, I'm above the lesion or under the lesion, right? So go to LAO, nope, oh, I'm in it. Or of course, if you see that you're not, you make adjustments. And that's the beauty of the real-time imaging is I can then take, I, I have a Monarch. I can use my Monarch, make some minor adjustments and get myself in plane. The other cool thing, I don't know about your Bronx suite, we're awash with too much equipment, too many wires and cables and things everywhere. This is the footprint. The main unit, which can, is actually sticks under a table in the back corner, because you almost never interact with this thing. The board that lays under the patient, so that's under the mattress, or the, you know, the padding that the patient lays under, so that's nothing. And then this, which is actually completely unnecessary, it's really just to hold the iPad. And I don't think it's really an iPad, but it's an iPad. And so um, that's the interacting unit. So footprint-wise is none. And how does it work? Well, obviously, you know, from a CT scan, you use an algorithm to obviously create TOMO images from the series of x-rays. But Body Vision's AI imaging, what it does, you use a standard C-arm. And this is the other beauty of it. The only thing we've purchased is the actual technology, you know, which is that. It's basically buying the software that runs this. My C-arm, that's the same C-arm that's been in my Bronx suite now for about eight years, a GE, whatever, like nothing special, it's just a C-arm. That, what we spin around the patient, collecting the data, and the AI algorithm gives you then those TOMO images to basically give you the C-arm-based tomography imagery that looks very darn similar to a CT scan. Is it exactly like a CT scan? Of course not. But I don't have a CT scanner in my Bronx suite. I got a C arm in my Bronx suite. So you get things like this. Here's a cone beam image. And from the same case, that's the lung vision image. Cone beam image, lung vision image. And this is actually a, a generation ago software. Um, and it's using a GE9900, which is the most common C arm. It's probably the C arm you guys all have. So you get less cost, any C-arm. Obviously, no one's trying to steal your C-arm. You know, you're not like, I gotta schedule C-arm time today, you know. Um, lot less radiation exposure. No one's running out of the room for this thing. And if you actually have one of the 3D C-arm, CD, uh, 3D uh, C-arms, a fancier new C-arm, if you've got one of those, for example, the Siemens Sios, you get some cool images. Look what happens when you use the Siemens Sios with lung vision. You get some cooler images. You actually get it cleaned up. This is what the AI algorithms do for you. So if you have an advanced C-arm, I have a, this is, I have this. 
And these are the images we get. But if you have a Sios, which I think Sonali has, you get images like that. And you get them in all three planes. In other words, you actually get something that looks exactly like a CT scan. But you're getting it with the equivalent of that 3D C arm. So because the system works with every C arm, it obviously has some extra uh, features that show up when you use a, a more advanced C arm. And so essentially what this slide is always telling you is that you've got, with this tool, the ability to do intraoperative 3D imaging. With any Bronc platform, works with robots, there's people that are doing it with the ION, there's people doing it with thin scopes, they also have their own catheter, so you can obviously navigate simply with a blind catheter equivalent using the fluoroscopic overlay of the pathway. So there's a very low cost way to navigate, so if you have zero peripheral platforms, Lung vision is actually a solution that lets you get to the periphery with a catheter that's cheaper than any other catheter on the market. That's fact. <laughs> and at the same time, be able to get out there just guiding yourself fluoroscopically with an overlay as to where to turn and rotate. But obviously, if you're using some other system, you have the ability to hybridize it. So time for some data. So this is a single center, single user, this was 45 consecutive cases that I did combining Oris with body vision. It's retrospective. We went back so you know, we can all feel free to journal club the crap out of it um, and say what's all wrong with it. There were your representative lesions, a lot of right upper lobe, um, 16 millimeter lesions on average, um, the robot time uh, total, and then the procedure time. So you saw that it didn't seem to add a lot. And the setup time for lung vision is about two minutes. So we can slice this data several ways. So I'm going to slice it several ways. Right up front, if you want to be hyper conservative, oops, bring this with me. We've got, we had specific benign diagnoses and ones that we just specifically said were malignant. So that's a 78% yield. That's the conservative answer. I don't like the full liberal one. So what I'm going to tell you is we're going to look at this one. We're going to cut it across this way because these that we had benign diagnoses, they said it was inflammation, which is always one of those like, eh, but then on follow-up imaging, it went away. And then these ones that said CT pendings, they went away as well. So this one, the slide was made, um, they've not had their follow-up yet. These images, dis uh, lesions disappeared. So that would actually make the data, and I would argue here at 91%. I don't believe this one that was these true, true non-diagnostics, um, even though it went for surgery and was re resected and was benign, to me that's, so it's right here. So I would argue what this did, at least based off of 45 whole patients, um, took our yield that was obviously lower, as Sonali pointed out, across platforms, um, and when adding the real-time imaging, getting the ability to have much higher yields. And I'll back up with her one slide, because that was actually, from my case, this one. So when we were here, this is, how, this is an example of how the technology works. We were here. Dead on, Monarch says, you've got this thing, nail it. Rebus had nothing. We moved then the Monarch, steering it only towards the augmented yellow ball, meaning the augmented lung vision answer. So it was a centimeter away. So now I'm here, I'm nowhere near Oris is telling me where to be. I'm where lung vision has told me to be. I don't have the screen to show you. And that's the Rebus image and that was the diagnostic. That's where, you know, again, going after small things, the CT to body divergence is what kills you. But to be able to do a Tomo spin, see the lesion today, it also, by the way, helps you avoid that scenario where the scan's like three, four weeks old and you're biopsying a ghost, because when you do the spin and it's not there, <laughs> um, you go, oh, I guess it did go away. So there's other data, of course. There's been two body vision papers published um, Joe uh, and myself, and then uh, versus cone beam papers, which is obviously similar to what we see with lung vision. And you'll see yields compared to obviously what had been uh, described prior. And then I'm going to show you some cases here quick. So this was an 8 millimeter right upper lobe lesion. There was no direct airway to the lesion. It was bracketed by two blood vessels. And on our first pass, we got renal cell, but let me show you how we did this. Um, well, this is, there it is. Okay, so there's the tomo spin. You can see my tool there and you can see the small lesion. That's the CT correlate to it. And we confirmed that it was there. And then under live fluoro, what you'll see, if it plays, there it is. Maybe, there it is. 
Okay, that was the rebus confirming that we liked where that lesion was located. Then as we're zooming in, and obviously what's not on the video, I rotated to LAO40 and RAO40 to confirm that I was still in lesion. That yellow ball is what I had said that day was the lesion, because I saw it. And so every time I'm passing an instrument into it, I know I'm going dead center in the lesion. Here's another one, a seven millimeter right upper lobe. You'll see under the tomo, see how it's a little thin little cavity looking thing? There it is, right? And you'll notice where the square started or the, the bullseye. The bullseye is where the CT scan said the lesion was preoperatively. When the patient was like this on the scanner with a full breath hold and not under general anesthesia. So you notice I moved it about a, yeah, roughly a centimeter. That's that CT to body divergence that Mike had published on. So now I said this is exactly where it is. And so now I can take biopsies right where it need to be and obviously cross any plane. And it was a met from their larynx. So anyway, that's me. Um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> and now we'll be quiet now. Uh, that's my contact information. It's being cut off. There's a D there. There, D Hogarth. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody, for your attention. I will, ju I will just make one last comment. The, the, the workflow is, is, is honestly really smooth. It takes two minutes to set up at the beginning, and then after that, every time you step on fluoro, you get that yellow overlay, period. So you know, if you're using fluoro in your bronc, why not actually have it be valuable? Because to be honest with you, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, how often when you step on fluoro, do you actually see the lesion? You see something wiggle and you go, I hope that sort of gray was where I think I'm at, right? So, yeah. So, like Kyle said, he has a GE fluoro machine. I'm lucky enough to have a Sios machine. So I'm just gonna quickly show images um, where we started when this system first came out, then with AI, how much it improved, and to show you how the images look um, today that we um, actually get. So a little bit of history about uh, where I work. There are six interventional pulmonologists where I work. We are a core group. We all use this uh, technology. We started back in 2019 with first generation body vision. And then the system got upgraded for us in 2021. And we do about an average, and, and, and at my institution I do, I have every platform you could imagine to be able to navigate to nodules. I have an ION, I have an ORIS, I have a SuperD, I have an Illumicide, I have body vision. <laughs> Makes life actually very complicated to decide which one to use. However, um, on average we're doing body vision about 80 navigations using the body vision um, a year. So I just want to go over the evolution of um, this imaging. So when it first came out, um, we used to do angles, um, the orbital angle used to be about 90 degrees. So we were going LAO to RAO. When we first started out, we were going like 35 to 35. And then we saw that the more information we gave, the better the imaging got. And so we then started going up to orbital angles up to 180 with the um, upgrade. Um, so now you could go 90 to 90. We generally, though, to be honest, are going about 50 to 50 uh, when we're doing our, our spins on these patients currently. This is actually um, a, a case of um, Pritchett's. This is a right lower lobe 12 millimeter um, nodule. Over here on the um, left side, you can see is the CT-based tomography images that you're getting. And then you can see how much clearer your imaging gets now. Um, sorry, this was on the right-hand side for you guys, left-hand side for me looking there, and how much clearer your images um, get. This is us over at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a right upper lobe, this was actually one of Joe's cases, right upper lobe, eight millimeter uh, nodule. Here you can see the intraoperative uh, tomo you're getting, and now with the new software, you can see how clear it is. It's almost like you're getting CT imaging. So this looks very familiar to a CT scan. When you guys are in there, you're getting images of the coronal, sagittal, and axial views. This is how good your imaging is now with that upgraded software. Again, this is another right upper lobe, 13 millimeter um, nodule that you're seeing. Again, this is the C-arm based initial platform we were seeing. And then you go to the AI Tomo and you can see how much clearer your imaging is getting. So I just wanted to highlight to you guys how good this imaging is when you're doing these cases in your Bronx suite. 
So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our esteemed thoracic surgeon. You're probably representing all thoracic surgeons at this conference. We appreciate that. <laughs> That's a pretty small, uh, small group, Did I think. Did everyone hold on to your apples? <laughs> hey, well, my name is Joe Whitlark, and I am a robotic, robotic thoracic surgeon, director of robotic surgery at Crozier Health in the Philadelphia market. And today I've been asked to talk to you guys about uh, insights from a thoracic surgery standpoint when we're looking at uh, navigation of bronchoscopy. So I'm a thoracic surgeon, and I do my own bronchoscopic uh, biopsies. And Kyle and I were actually talking about this beforehand. Um, I started doing these several years ago with a Super D because I wanted to mark my lesions when I did a surgical biopsy. So unfortunately, uh, our interventional pulmonologist left the system and they had trouble replacing him. So I moved on and started doing diagnostic navigational bronchoscopies. And I discovered a few things. I was, uh, I was uh, discovered how important it is for us to look at things from different perspectives. One from a thoracic surgery standpoint, but another is from an IP standpoint. So as a member, active member of our lung panels, you start looking at things differently. And I actually think that it really helped me and helped us a lot because you start looking at the patient more in a continuum about what are we gonna do after this biopsy. So I interacted more with our radiation oncology and our medical oncologist and our interventional um, radiologist about the best biopsy, how to proceed, and, about, and we also had a plan for afterwards. So we sort of started looking at this at a little bit of a bigger picture, which was great because it really made things more efficient for us. We're starting to think about the next step. I'm thinking of it from a surgical standpoint or you know, do we put fiducials in? And, um, so, and we already had medical oncology hooked in, so we sped things up. And uh, my prior job, when I first started doing this, our time from discovery of a nodule to a definitive treatment was 120 plus days. And we got it down to 32, which while not perfect, is still a great, a great thing. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was doing the interventional pulmonology. So, one thing, and I've talked to Kyle about this in the past too, so I was recruited by Crozier Health a couple years ago, and when I came, I had the, I, had the, uh, I was able to negotiate. So one, one of the things I negotiated was make sure I had essentially unfettered access to a Bronx suite with anesthesia. A little easier for me because I'm a thoracic surgeon, I work with anesthesia all the time. But I also had to have the pathologist in the room with me or next to me, so we had pathology there, and they had to get me a Monarch because we were using the Super D. So since September of 2020, I've done about 230 cases, and I want to talk about some of our experience with that, and then with the addition of body vision. So as I stated, knowing the role of the navigational bronchoscopy is great. It helps our patients navigate through the system much faster. And um, in our first 102 cases, our time from diagnosis or from the diagnostic procedure to their treatment was 24 days, which I think is quite good compared to, our, compared to us before that. So we had excellent yields. Our first 102 cases, our diagnostic yield was, was really high. It was uh, 87%. And uh, it was, it's come down some in the 130 cases we've done since then, but that's pretty high. So one of the questions that was asked was, if you have excellent results with the Monarch, why do you want to add body vision? And the reason I wanted to add body vision was exactly what Kyle said, because all of us that do this have gone out had a lesion, navigate it out, see it perfectly, and you put your radial ultrasound probe and you see nothing. So, so we would do that and I would see nothing. So I would take my rebus, I'm sure much as everybody else, we would look around with the rebus, I would go to different airways and I would hope that I would get, we would find a lesion. I, that was quite un satisfying for me. I really don't like that feeling at all. So with body vision and as uh, with the CT, CT I mean, with the, um, the divergence that uh, Dr. Sethi talked about so eloquently, that's a problem, um, you know, with the divergence. Our ability with body vision to be able to, to um, correct for that is just as Kyle and uh, just as Kyle said, it's, it's uh, I think it's game changing actually. So I want to talk about a case I did yesterday with this. So the screening CT shows uh, a woman that has a, a nodule, 12 millimeters, upper lobe, and uh, 
I go right out to it, it's right in front of me. I think this is gonna be a great case where you get it on the first shot. We see nothing. So I reposition it using the, the, uh, the body vision. And I actually had to reposition this. I was about 15 millimeters away and put our rebus in. It's right in the middle of it. And this is a beautiful tool and lesion shot. And we were right in the middle of it. And we got a diagnosis. So we had a, uh, we got a, it's a non-small cell. And so they got that yesterday. So I think this case illustrates the value I see in body vision when we're doing these cases, because again, it's a bad feeling when you don't see anything when you're out there, especially, uh, as Dr. Hugart said, when you have a small lesion, a little bit of uh, divergence is really going to mess you up. So we also, we, um, Kyle touched on things that I think are very important. One is, uh, is uh, our workflow. Workflow with a, um, with a uh, cone beam is uh, difficult. We actually had, um, the hospital is actually gonna get a cone beam. They approved it from capital budget and we were gonna get one. But then I trialed the um, trialed body vision. So I told them to hold off on it because I liked it. And one of the things I liked about it was it doesn't really affect our workflow. And nor does it add much in the way of fluoro. We, have, we looked at our 40 cases and our, uh, we only increased our fluoro time by 45 seconds and that's come down. It took a, yesterday, we used two minutes and 30 seconds to do that case. So it's a, um, I don't think that's really a, uh, an issue. And so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, <laughs> surgeons and hospital revenue. So, you know, I've been a surgeon for a long time and I've always heard surgeons get whatever they want because they make a lot of money for the hospital. So if you go in and ask for something, and as Kyle said, interventional pulmonology does not bring in a lot of revenue. I would disagree with that though. So once I got this Monarch and I come to this new system, I want to justify why we got it. So for our first 102 cases, we looked at what the, uh, we looked at the revenue we brought in and we were surprised. Um, so this is sort of a, an odd system because they didn't have a robotic surgeon and didn't have an IP uh, and I came in, so this was all new for us. But at the end of 10 months, we our, the revenue for the hospital conservatively was 1.4 million. When you go to your administrator, your CFI and you say, uh, CFO and you go, I really want this technology because it's gonna help me. They don't really want to, they hear that, but their big thing is, the bottom line is it's not gonna improve revenue. And I think it will. And I think for us, you know, we're in a tough market. I'm sure like a lot of you, we are uh, competing with uh, a lot of systems in the Philadelphia area. So when I go in and I'm able to offer them these procedures, we get a diagnosis. We keep those in the system and they would leak out. So it was a financial boon for the hospital. And they knew that. So when I came up and told them I wanted to get body vision, they said, sure, you can get it. And not because I'm a surgeon, it's because we showed that our IP, that our interventional pulmonary procedures was a revenue producer. It kept patients in the system. So just to sum it up, I think it's important to know the role for, for navigational bronchoscopy when it comes to working up lung nodules and lung cancer patients. It's really, I've been doing this a long time as a surgeon. It's only been in the last six or seven years that I've been doing the navigational bronchs. It's opened my eyes a lot, really, to see things from a different uh, perspective. And I think it's been great, really has increased the speed that we work patients up. We decrease the time from diagnosis to, to procedure and definitive treatment. Um, I think that the body, uh, body vision is great. I think it's really helped me. And I think I don't have confirmation like Dr. Hogarth does, but I think it's going to help our yields tremendously. Because our, my big problem, I could tell you before we even got a rose whether or not the procedure I was doing was going to come back, whether it was going to be something non-diagnostic or not. The fact that we can navigate out and we have another tool to help us do that is tremendous. Um, does not increase, just as Dr. Hogarth said, I find it at the workflow, once you get used to it, and the, uh, and the radiation exposure is really not an issue. But, and most importantly for all of the in interventional pulmonologists in the cr crowd, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty high percentage, is to know your, know your value. And I think looking at the numbers and looking at the, uh, the revenue you bring into the hospital, because one patient that's kept in your system because of a procedure you did is going to generate a tremendous amount of income from surgery, more radiate, I mean, more uh, radiologic studies, and um, chemotherapy and radiation. So I think that's something important to remember. Thank you guys very much.
uh, and have slides on. We're part of a couple different clinical trials of injecting things into tumors. All third-party stuff, doesn't matter you know, what we're injecting per se. That's different than ablation. Ablation where you're gonna clearly need to be in the middle and you're gonna probably at the moment for these trials need cone beam. But the studies that are injecting various agents into tumors only require proof that you're in the lesion. And we've been able to use the AI TOMO to see that our needle, that we're about to inject whatever it is, into the lesion. And so it's actually opened up various therapeutic trials that only require the agent to be basically touching the tumor. Um, so just as another adjunct, you don't have to go sell a kidney to get cone beam time to be able to put these various things into tumors. Any questions from anybody? If you raise your hand, there's a mic. I did not expect anything less. Yes, Dr. Oz. Do you want to answer or I can answer well, what so we do? Go, go ahead. So I can tell you, yes, that's a real problem. We're all aware of it. Um, so we do follow um, high ventilatory, high PEEP protocols um, when we intubate our patients. So we try to min minimize absolutely the time from going to sleep and intubating a patient with an ET tube. We do much higher tidal volumes. We do much higher PEEPs uh, when we go out there. We recruit right before if we need to, if we see that atelectasis happening. A lot of times you can see it on fluoro, and you can see it when you do the spin. You can see it. You do your best. Obviously, it occurs more in the lower lobes. There's no particular trick I have unless you guys have something no, other we, than. We follow the Pioneer's protocol for anesthesia, and that helps a great deal. And we navigate right away. So right before exactly. we set up our robot, we've already done some several breath holds and recruitment maneuvers. But if there is atelectasis, it's going to look the same, unfortunately, right? I mean, the lesions get obscured in it, and so um, there'd have to be another recruitment maneuver. I will tell you, so far, I've not had the experience of losing my lesion on Tomo because of atelectasis. Not lucky, I guess. I mean, I, you know, but I'm, I'm sure it will happen. The problem is, like for everybody, even on a CT. You know, atelectasis is atelectasis, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's why when we're doing a valve workup, we gotta make sure your nodule's benign before I occlude that entire, you know, lobe. So um, I don't think that it has the ability to distinguish. I've not seen the ability to see my lesion versus atelectasis. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons that we changed how we do things, right? Before, we always used to do the EBUS first and then go after the nodule if the lymph nodes were, were, were clean. And now we've switched that completely. And you go to the nodule right away. If the lymph nodes, you know, obviously aren't lighting up on PET or look big or whatever, go to the nodule right away, then come back and do your staging appropriately after. Right. Right. For yes. 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 Right. Um, well, That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. It's a good idea. Don't know, it's something we'd have to ask the engineers. Um, I bet you, well, if, if the problem was posed, um, that it could. The issue is, you saw in the background, there's all those dots, those are tungsten beads that are in that board. The machine is recognizing the relationship of all the beads yeah. to the ribs and the scapula and the trachea and the main crina. The main crina is the one thing you register around. The AI is reading all of that and its relationship to everything. That's how it knows where things are all located. So it would have to be, very different to be to register the patient that way, essentially. Yeah. Right, and I just don't know if the software can do it. I, yeah, I think it still relies on the beads at that point in time. That'd be a question we'd have to ask the engineers. But luckily, the various people that can ask the engineers are standing here in the room. So, so, so you're using the beads, you're not using electromagnetic grid. There's zero electromagnetic grid. There's actually fewer measurement points if you're on the side. Is that so, so the, the beauty of this system is that there is no electromagnetic. It is fluoro only. So, and I, so the, the one paper that was up there, Joe's paper, is data using just the fluoro navigation. So no electromagnetic, no robot, a blind catheter following the line guidance on the fluoro to the yellow ball that you've marked. And it yields better than any of the robot papers. So for a guy who likes robots, I will tell you that the lung vision data at least 
the limits of all publications and blah, 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 is superior to robotics by itself. Both systems. Because it's real-time imaging. But on one level, why does this surprise any of us? IR is better than us because they can always see that they've got the tool in the lesion. This tool lets us, for the first time, prove that you're in the lesion. Now, the lesion may not be in your tool, but, but at least you, but the beauty of it, because you can do that 3D view, take a picture of that, plant that in your report, when people try to say, well, are you sure you were in it? Yeah, I'm actually really sure I was in it. So we're gonna get a follow-up CT. So that way, because you, you know, you get the pushback from your thoracic surgeons who say, well, we better go cut it out, because you didn't prove it was cancer. And we don't see a bug, and so, you know, but all kidding aside, what, what you're also helping your surgeons avoid unnecessary receptions of benign disease, which makes them look bad too, right? That counts against them on their numbers. Yep. yep. Curing histo with surgery. <laughs> you know, it's, I never thought about turning the table like that, um, but I think that if you just turn the table, that, um, yeah. that your, your, your so uh, tongues yeah, and beans, you tongues and beans would stay in place. That would help, because the board would, be would stay back there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, then it would work. Potentially. Yeah, I'm not sure how high up. Well, you'd have to strap them in really well. That's a cool uh, <laughs> It's an interesting question, though. We'll have to ask the engineers about that. But, but I was so, so far, not on wood, um, I haven't uh, had Alexis be an issue. But I think that's also because we, we follow Mike's protocol on ventilation, and yeah. that helps a great deal. Yeah. I haven't seen that either. Yeah. yeah. Today. Yeah. yeah. Or I've been biopsying out Alexis. <laughs> so, okay, uh, can you comment on the workflow in terms of like initial, like when let's say when the patient has gotten the CT scan, do you have to do any registration on the like CT scan software before you start the procedure and then, you know, how much of uh, fluoro, I know you mentioned about maybe going 180 or 90, so I wanted to try to get like what are we exactly doing during the procedure. So the workflow, and if I forget a step, just cut me off. So you get, the, you get the CT scan, it gets inserted into a software program, just like a lot of the other technologies you have. You plan the lesion, you see a pathway, you see a virtual pathway to it, so you know, kind of have a great idea of where you're going. You then uh, put the patient asleep, you then do a registration. Registration for this is of the main carina, so it's a spin around the main carina, then you put the machine over wherever the lesion is, whether it's the left side or right side, you do a breath hold, and it's a spin around the lesion then. So it identifies, finds the lesion, and then you can start your navigation at that point. What's yeah. really interesting is that, so at the very beginning, if you just step on the floral pedal, the, the, the augmented overlay will say the lesion's right here, because that's on the pre-op CT. You mark that on any, like any planning software. Then, you, when, so like I said, when you do the registration around the lesion, when you update it, what you'll watch on your screen it is moves. it goes to It here. moves. So this is where we thought it was. It's where your, your robot and your brain thinks it is based off the CT. And lung vision, because you just marked it, says, actually, no, it's actually over here. Or however much it decides right. to move based on CT to body convergence. And then you can even, if you don't believe it, if you turn it off and it'll go back to the original registration, you will see CT to body convergence for real right in front of you. You were going to, and that's why, like, even his case from yesterday, you navigate it right to the virtual target, the target that the pre-op CT said where the lesion is, you can't find it. And now what you're doing is using that same platform to drive to the augmented fluoro and see where it is, and then you get your signal. So, can I say one of, the, one of the things that's nice about this, right, is that, yeah. one of the things that's nice about this is that, you know, what we're used to doing with prior technologies is you, you navigate in the 2D plane, right, in the, you know, just one plane. And the great thing about this is you could take your C-arm and, and you could actually find a better plane to kind of navigate to, right? So if there's something that's very anterior or posterior, right, the, the regular AP plane is you don't kind of know where you are a lot of times. And here, you could just, you could just go into, I wind up doing a lot of my navigations in LAO 30 or LAO 40, right? Um, and, and, and not just in the LAO RAO plane, you could go forward and back. And yeah. the technology takes you, is, is agnostic to whatever plane you're in. So even if it's a, a lower lobe along the diaphragm, or if there's a rib in front, you could always just do a lordotic kind of thing. 
thing and, and, na and navigate whatever plane you want. Right, because you can change the gauge to about 20 degrees as well, too, in that plane. So. You know, sometimes two airways in the AP plane are right on top of each other, but when you go into LAO, you know, they separate. Oh, I needed to be in this one, not, not in this one. So you, as you do more and more of these, you learn not to do, you know, AP kind of a coronal navigation. You do them at all different types of angles that suit you best. The, um, to, and to answer your question about the setup, what are we about five minutes even? Yeah, you know, before it's we, fast. Before really we fast. Into nodules, it's very. It used to be older versions used twenty minutes. Robots now are it's like five longer. minutes. And I mean, I, I, I'm not a paid consultant here. I'm a, I, I'm Snelly's partner. She'll tell you that I'm telling the truth here. But the other day, right before I came here, on Tuesday, I had a case. Set up to biopsy was like seven minutes. All right, and I was done in 20. So it could be that fast um, because you have everything that you need right in front of you. And it's the same thing that you have if you did it with a robot and a cone beam suite. It just, it just takes a lot longer and costs a lot more money. It, it's also been getting faster. So like Joe said, it used to take longer. The core thing that drives us is software, right? There's, no, there's not really hardware, right? I mean, there's an iPad, that's third party. There's a CPU, that's third party. So it's the AI algorithms that are driving this that only keep getting better as more cases get done, number one. Number two, as they also keep working on the software to speed up the processing. So the pro you know, it used to take, when you do a Tomo spin around the lesion, it used to take about two minutes to process it. Now it's about 30 seconds. That was pure, just better software. You know, I don't know, I'm not a software engineer in the slightest, but basically making the code better, right? So I'm optimistic that this is only going to continue to improve because obviously the company keeps iterating and there it is. So. They respond to our, our, our um, suggestions. Kyle and I have a lot of suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Just, uh, yeah. This stuff, the training, the one that performed the spin, does yeah. it have a specific training, like how much film they need to be perfect? Yeah. The right, 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 right. So um, the, this is the, the, where to put the, the, the C armor on the lesion. The software guides you. So it just takes you. yourself over. It says, hey, move two Four centimeters. Four centimeters here, two here, yeah, one two, front, one back. So there's no training. Yeah. It's look at the screen until all the checkboxes. Tells there. you where to move the floor. And then the spinning of the C arm, it's whoever runs your C arm. Yeah. So if you have a tech in the room, great. Which is me. You the funnel. So there's the cool. The cool runs the C arm. Uh, uh, <laughs> you could hire him. <laughs> He's working for a job. <laughs> But in our case, our nurses, and we don't have techs, I do all the registration and everything beforehand. And then I go behind, and then you know I bring it in, and then once the fluoro is there, it's there. But then because I have a SIOS, I can remotely do the spin you know, with a pad that they have as well. So I can do it all myself um, behind at that point. I don't, they can't afford a tech for us. So. But it's whatever, it's whatever technology you have. I that's, get everything else, just not The beauty of it is it works with what you have. That's the thing that, for me, like, yeah, well, this was a one-time capital purchase. There's because we don't use their catheter; we're using it with the robot. I've, I've had no costs associated since, other than if there would be some major upgrade, we'll have to buy an upgrade fee or whatever. I'm sure, but like, there's not a disposal. If you're using it as your only navigation platform, yeah, there's a fee. The fee is the now the, the, the disposable, which is cheaper than every other one of the catheters that are in this exhibit hall right now. So your costs would go down if you are currently using like an EM system. And you don't, you're not going to use it anymore, or whatever. Your cap cost will go down because the cost of the disposable cap is less than the current ones on the market. Correct, guys. I mean, I'm not lying. Body measure people. All right. Is it set up as one machine, or can you go between multiple? Any fluoro machine. Any fluoro. It'll work with any fluoro machine. Yep. yep. Any fluoro machine. Okay. And the setup is the same. Mm-hmm. Doesn't require the G9800 or 9900. And then, as far as your, yeah, you know, suppose you get the system, you get the PO, and you're ready to get going, what is the setup like? What is the company here to help train the facility? <laughs> they will give you the support that you need for the cases that you're doing. So, they will be there with you doing all the cases until you feel comfortable and you feel like you can function on your own and you don't need them anymore. But the truth is, the, the setup is your CR. Yeah. They're, they're really. Can't stress how little setup there actually is. There's, I, they've got, like, they post. We filmed some video at our hospital of setting it up, how to do it. it, it 
I'll show the, to guide you towards it, but you'll see for real how easy it is to set up. Because you're already using a CR. It's just now a CR with real data. And the planning software and everything is, if you've been doing navigation procedures in your career, is very intuitive to use. It's very easy. Like, it, it, on the iPad, if you just read, it tells you what to do. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's very like, easy. Like, like Medtronic, like SuperDimension, like right. Ion, like look, Right, all, every other and, you know. planning software. Anything uh, else? You guys have a couple minutes. Um, the next session, I think, starts at 1, so there's about five minutes if you guys need to take a break before going on to the next sessions. <laughs>